Hello, and welcome to Transformation by Truth podcast, where the call become the chosen and those who have been dedicated and serve the Most High receive the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as we progress our quest for holiness, perfection, and everlasting life. My name is D.L. Anderson. I'll be your tour guide. Let's get started with today's lesson. Hello, my friends. D.L. Anderson here. Welcome back to Transformation by Truth podcast and the quest for holiness, perfection, and everlasting life. Today, we continue with week nine, the quest for holiness series. Two weeks to prepare you for the journey of a lifetime. Today's podcast is Lecture B, a word of truth accounting of the quest for holiness, perfection, and everlasting life, day three. The title of today's podcast is When We Fail to Repent. Do you despise the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of Elohim leads you to repentance? Romans 6, 4. Lecture B objectives are analyze those who despise kindness, discuss why we should not frustrate the grace of Elohim, examine the danger of a seared conscience, and prove why guarding your conscience is invaluable. For those in our virtual book club, this lecture references chapter six of the Pinnacle of Holiness, volume two, Repent for the Kingdom. Now, our first section is entitled, Those Who Despise Kindness. We would like to begin this podcast by analyzing our feature verse and the decisive question, do you despise the riches of Elohim's kindness and tolerance and patience? I believe most believers, despite their levels of commitment to the Father's will, will answer this question with a resounding no. Yet, just because they are saying no with their mouths, does not mean they are saying no with their actions. You should know this from the lectures on the composition of man in the most recent series on sin. Due to the complex nature of our makeup, our words and our actions are not always congruent. This is because our actions, more than our words, reflect what is in our hearts. For as you know, the heart is where intentions are formed, and our intentions determine our actions. Here's a question. What do we know about the spiritual conditions and the nature of our heart prior to the initial salvation and in the early stages of our quest for holiness? The answer, the heart is a danger zone as it pertains to sin. And in the most recent series on sin, we accurately labeled the heart as a sin factory, for all sin is developed in the heart. See Mark 7, 21 to 23. This speaks to why so many are saying, I despise the kindness of Elohim with their sinful actions. We know this because Shaul makes it very clear that those who despise the kindness of Elohim are not being led to repent. Rather, they're continuing in their sins. This is unrighteousness on top of disobedience, for we are taught not to frustrate the grace of Elohim. For his grace does not exist to make us comfortable with sin. Quite the contrary. It exists so that we might make an end of sin in our lives once and for all. 
Now, our next section is entitled, Do Not Frustrate the Grace of Elohim. Galatians 2.16 reads, A man is not justified by works of the law, but through belief in Yahushua Messiah. Even we have believed in Messiah Yahushua in order to be justified by belief in Messiah and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And if, while seeking to be justified by Messiah, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Messiah then a servant of sin? Let it not be. For if I rebuild what I once overthrew, I establish myself a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law in order to live to Elohim. I have been impaled with Messiah, and I no longer live, but Messiah lives in me. And that which I now live in the flesh, I live by belief in the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of Elohim, for if righteousness is through the law, then Messiah died for naught. My L, there is so much to unpack here, so much truth in this passage of Scripture. I would start with the command not to frustrate the grace of Elohim, an action that can only be taken when you continue in sin. For any believer who is struggling with sin is not making consistent progress, neither are they bearing good fruit. Here's the question. What happens to trees, i.e. in the form of men and women, that do not bear good fruit? The answer, they are hewn down and cast into the fire. See Matthew 3.10, 7.19, and Luke 3.9. In the case of men and women, the fire that is being referenced in Matthew and in Luke is the lake of fire, i.e. endless death. The reason being is sure. That is, when you frustrate the grace of Elohim, you are setting aside his grace. That is to say, every time you sin, you are gradually eliminating the factor of grace reserved for your quest. Eventually, once you have gone too far in your rebellion and your sin, the Father will recall his spirit and leave you to your own devices. And I said before, you will be a marked man or a woman and on Satan's territory. And the word of truth reveals your latter end will be worse than the first. Therefore, with awesome finality, I warn you, do not frustrate the grace of Elohim. Now, our next section is entitled, The Danger of a Seared Conscience. I don't usually venture too far beyond a warning, but on this occasion, I've been led to do so. This is because of the danger involved in frustrating the grace of Elohim and what is happening inside of you. Trust me, if people truly understood all the negative effects of setting aside the grace of Elohim, many of them would reconsider. Here's a question. What is the great danger in frustrating the grace of Elohim and perpetual backsliding? The answer, besides the short and long-term effects of the worst spiritual disease of all time, the great danger is a seared conscience. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 reads, Now the Spirit distinctly says that in latter times, some shall fall away from the belief, paying attention to seducing, i.e. misleading spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
we can painlessly tie the spiritual phenomena of a seared conscience to one's failure to repent by analyzing the verses I just shared. Expressly, Shaul is warning Timothy and us that many will be misled by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Here's the question. Is there a unifying theme behind all the doctrines of devils? In essence, is there a central lie, focus, or assault they are employing to destroy the destinies of those who have been called? The answer is yes, and it is on repentance. Remember, my friends, repentance is your spiritual trump card, for it not only allows you to experience divine remission, it increases the measures of grace and favor the Father invests in you and your quest. Believe me, this is a bigger deal than most realize, for grace and favor are not only factors that address sin, even more so, they are factors that determine the spiritual and physical conditions of your quest. Truly, without an abundance of grace and favor, you would find this course near impossible to master. This brings us back to the vast importance of repentance and why our enemies have centralized all their attacks on this conduit. It's because the easiest way that can cause us to fail our quest and join them and their plunge into endless death is by eradicating our connection to the kingdom of heaven while deceiving us into believing we are still connected. Now, our next section is entitled, Why You Must Guard Your Conscience. If that were not bad enough, it gets even worse. For every time you fail to repent, your conscience is being seared via a spiritual process that the word of truth likens to a hot iron. No doubt, I have shared several worst-case spiritual scenarios with you in previous series. If you're keeping a list, you should add a seared conscience to the top of your list. For of all these worst case spiritual scenarios, this one has the least potential of recovery. Here is why. The great peril in having a seared conscience lies in the fact that the natural process of repentance is destroyed due to a loss of sensitivity to conviction. And where there is no conviction, there can be no condemnation. Thus, in these situations, the individual is completely unaware of their need to repent. As I said before, things couldn't get worse, for the conscious is the moral compass of the mind. It is the mental checkpoint of the thought dimension and one of the few attributes of your default nature that works in concert with the Holy Spirit to free the body from sin. You could view him as the grown-up in the room. For this cause, Satan fiercely desires to eradicate your conscience. This is why he does not stop with elimination. He goes beyond that point and he demolishes it. See, Satan is not content with you backsliding or having a bad day. No, he wants to close the door on your salvation while you are living. He wants to make sure every victory he achieves in your life stands and none of your sins are remitted. He wants you to inherit the same fate he has inherited. And as you can clearly see, he is as ruthless as he is cunning. This is why you must guard your conscience. As Elohim lives, you will fail to repent if it becomes defective or inoperable in any way. Thus, I'll say it again with emphasis. Guard your conscience. Guard your conscience. Guard your conscience. 
Now, here is the final word. If you fail to repent in your quest, you should plan to fail your quest. Have you heard the saying, no good can come from this? How about, there is no way this is going to end well. Believe me, more appropriate words cannot be spoken concerning those who are not following the true model of repentance. Rather, they are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The deception, my friends, extends beyond the disastrous end waiting for these individuals, some of whom are victims, some of whom are perpetrators, and all of whom are heading toward the point of no return. That is, the juncture in this life where you have forfeited the hope of salvation while you are yet living. You know, my friends, the greatest deception lies in what is beneath the surface. Like the infamous Trojan horse, there is a plethora of spiritual deficits and suffering Satan includes in every ploy. And both sudden and constant destruction will come upon all who buy into them, and that is before they die. This is what happens when we fail to repent. Now, here is the assignment for today. In your prayers, meditate on this word of truth and ensure you understand the dangers of failing to repent and guard yourself from each one every hour of every day. Sila. Now, here is what's next in this series. We have three today's podcast, When We Fail to Repent. And tomorrow's podcast is entitled, Daily Walking in Repentance. Now, if you are a member and have questions, please click the Q&A box underneath the video player. Likewise, if you have comments you want to share with the group, please share those in the comment box located beneath the Q&A box. Now, if you're not a member and you have questions about today's podcast, feel free to contact us via our website at www.pinnacleofholiness.com and use the form on our contact page and we will respond to you as soon as we can. And thank you for being with us today. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Remember to tune in with us every Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And if you haven't already, visit us at www.pinnacleofholiness.com and make sure you sign up to join the quest for holiness, perfection, and everlasting life 2022.